And it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Bill Minikosi from MIT. Um, Bill received his PhD from Stanford under the supervision of Rick Shane, and his field is geometric measure theory. Now, one of the main themes in geometric measure theory is the search for selected special geometric objects, such as harmonic maps, minimal surfaces, Einstein metrics in the context of Riemannian manifolds. Now, on minimal surfaces, which, as you know, is a century-old subject, Bill Minikosi and uh, Tobias Kolding were able to find a completely new approach on embedded two-dimensional minimal surfaces of bounded genus in arbitrary Riemannian three-manifolds. Um, they developed the structure theory without any minimizing stability assumptions, without area growth, and this main body of work was honored by the Oswald Veblen Prize uh, in 2010. Uh, on another area, uh, Bill studied uh, the important class of Riemannian manifolds that have some lower bound on their Ricci uh, curvature. And uh, let me just state one uh, easily uh, uh, understood result, which I think is quite beautiful, and it resolved the conjecture of Yao. If you have one of these complete Riemannian manifolds of non-negative uh, Ricci curvature, and you look at the class of harmonic functions that satisfy some upper bound, polynomial upper bound of a certain degree on um, the function, then this class of functions is finite dimensional, provided the volume growth of the manifold is Euclidean, thus extending the idea of the Liouville theorem to a huge, um, uh, much more general class. Now, in the, in the last few decades, in geometric measure theory, not just static objects were understood, but also um, moving objects governed by some parabolic geometric uh, system of partial differential equations, such as mean curvature flow, Ricci flow. Bill contributed to both flows, and in the last few years, Bill Minikosi and uh, Tobias Kolding uh, advanced a series of papers where they um, found a new angle on studying stability and genericity questions for the crucial singularities of mean curvature flow. And uh, so I'm now very much looking forward um, to a lecture on mean curvature flow. Uh, thank you, Gerhard, uh, for inviting me. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. And a um, couple of things before the talk. Uh, I would really encourage uh, questions. So if uh, you don't ask questions, I will probably go faster than I should. So please, that's something I tell my calculus students and they don't ask questions. So. OK, so a couple of themes that I want to emphasize in this talk. So uh, geometrically, I'd like to talk about some sharp bounds for singularity in the curvature flow. And handle, uh, on a, a similar viewpoint in analysis, I'd like to talk about optimal regularity for a classical degenerate elliptic nonlinear partial differential equation. So I'm going to touch on the work of many people in this talk. Um, so my own work that I'll talk about here is, is all joint with some people. So let me just remind you what mean curvature flow is. So in, in this setting, we have a, a family of hypersurfaces, MT, that's evolving by this uh, differential equation. At each point, or sorry, at each point in each time, the point is moving in the normal direction with speed given by the mean curvature. So the mean curvature is, um, this is the force from surface tension. So this hypersurface is pulling itself taut. Something that would be static or not moving for this, and if the mean curvature is zero, that's a, a minimal surface. That would be something that was in equilibrium for surface tension. So as the surface tension pulls it tight, the area decreases under the flow. So let's see some examples of this. So, of course, a minimal surface would be the simplest example. It would be static. It would not be moving under the flow. For ones that are moving, the simplest example would be a sphere. So if you take a, 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 a round sphere, then by symmetry, the mean curvature is the same at every point. So this roundness will be preserved under the flow. And so you get an ODE for the radius. So this is, uh, I'll restrict myself to R3 for almost all of the talk. 
everything can be done in higher dimensions, but the pictures are going to be simpler, the statement's simpler in R3. So one thing to notice when you work out this ODE, um, you notice that if you start with any finite radius, that radius goes to zero in a finite amount of time. So once it goes to zero, the, the solution disappears. So this is known as, as finite time extinction. So the flow only lives for a finite amount of time and, and then disappears. At the time when it disappears, there's a singularity of the flow. So likewise, you could do, um, so if you do this for a sphere, if you do it for a one-dimensional circle, that would also contract. Cross that with a line, you get a cylinder. So the curvature <coughs> is, is different, so the speed of contraction is different, and you get the same sort of phenomenon. You get a nice smooth solution up until some time at which the solution disappears, again, in extinction. In the case of the cylinder, uh, notice that what happens is as these cylinders contract, they go to a line. So here there's an entire line where things disappear, and the case of the sphere disappears at a point. So this, um, this is a general phenomenon. Let's see. So one feature of the flow is there's a maximum principle, so there's a, which gives an avoidance property. So if you take two different solutions of mean curve flow, and you flow them at the same time, if they're initially disjoint, they remain disjoint. Okay, so the reason for this is, um, so this picture is showing you schematically what, why you would have a problem if they didn't remain disjoint. To the left, you have the initial configuration, and the blue and the red both start flowing. If the red did catch up to the blue, then because the blue one is inside it, the blue one has to be curved more, which means the blue one is moving at a higher speed. But if it's moving at a higher speed, the red one could not have caught up. And so you could get a contradiction. So this is the, the parabolic maximum principle. So this avoidance property, so um, one of the things this tells us right away, we have these solutions of spheres, and we know these spheres shrink and become extinct in a finite amount of time. If you have any initial closed hypersurface, you could surround it by a sphere. By the time the sphere, um, and, and so now because the sphere sits around it, it doesn't touch. It can never touch in the future. The sphere dis disappears in some finite amount of time, and so therefore, the one that's contained inside must as well. So this tells us that if we start with something closed, so compact no boundary, we're guaranteed that singularities will develop. So now the point becomes to try to understand these singularities. I um, mentioned the first uh, theoretical result on the subject. So Gerhard, in 1984, uh, completely classified the, the situation when the initial hypersurface is convex. So if you have a closed convex surface and you run the flow, it stays convex and it remains smooth as it contracts. Up until some, some extinction time, where it disappears at a point. So this is exactly the picture that we saw for the sphere. And in fact, um, if you look at this flow just before it becomes extinct, so now it's a very tiny surface. If you were to magnify it to contain unit volume, it would almost be a sphere. And if you look at it even closer to the time of extinction, it's even closer to being a sphere. So, um, in fact, Gerard proved this in all dimensions for surfaces on up. The curiosity was a slightly different proof, but uh, an enormously different proof, was needed for the case of curves, the curve shortening flow. Um, so that was, was done by uh, Gage Hamilton, and, and Matt Grayson showed that that also extended the curve for not convex. <coughs> okay, so the, if you have a convex initial hypersurface, we now understand what happens. It remains convex under the flow until an extinction time, and just before this extinction time, it looks extremely round. So it sweeps through the entire surface of the initial bounds. So here's a non convex example. So this is, um, in the subject, this is usually called the marriage ring, uh, which people have complained about. No, I don't know. Uh, I've people have said, why, why not a wedding ring instead of a marriage ring? Or if you're in your marriage ring, why not marry a band? I don't know. Uh, oh, I should say, that's the other thing. So in addition to like, encouraging questions, um, my sense of humor is acquired. Uh, <laughs> now, in the, time for this talk, you unfortunately won't be able to acquire it, so just forgive me, except for those of you who already know. So now, so this, um, so what's going to happen if you start this flowing, this torus of revolution? 
So the symmetry will be preserved under the flow. Um, and again, this one, while not convex, it is mean convex. The mean curvature has a sign. It's always, the curvature always is pointing in, so the, the flow is always moving inward here. So this uh, contracts, <laughs> remaining, you know, keeping the symmetry of revolution until it disappears in a circle. So this is a new type of singularity. Instead of becoming, uh, instead of becoming extinct at a point, it becomes extinct along an entire curve of singularity. <laughs> Okay, so um, another example. So uh, Grayson, with his, uh, the, the term I alluded to for curves, he showed that this sort of extinction at a point was the only thing that happened for simple closed curves in the plane. If you have uh, embedded closed surfaces in R3, then other things can happen. You don't just get this extinction at a point. We saw one example with the dumbbell. Here's a, oh, sorry, with the marriage room. Here's a second example. This is the dumbbell. So imagine now that you have two large bells, and they're connected by a thin bar. So the bell region should contract roughly like a sphere. There's some perturbation of the sphere, at least for a short amount of time. On the other hand, the bar should look like a cylinder. So both of those things contract in a finite amount of time, where the time is given by the, in terms of the initial radius. If you make the, the bells large enough, they will still be around by the time the cylinder should have contracted. And so this, this is exactly what happens in this example. So he showed that if you run the mean, cur mean curvature flow with this surface, then you get a neck pinch singularity along the bar, disconnecting it into two pieces. Now the two bells are still alive, and so they start to shrink, um, eventually becoming extinct at round points. So here's a uh, so this, these figures were done via numerical simulation by Uber. Uh, <coughs> so to the top left, we see the initial dumbbell. And then we see time steps along the flow. So you'll see that the, the bells are shrinking much more slowly than the bar is. Then in the third, on the top, we see this, this neck pinch has occurred. It's separated into two components. These components now run more or less independently. Uh, independently, and, and they, they're becoming convex, and they'll disappear at, at round points. <coughs> so this symmetry of revolution, Question? you know, ah, excellent, thank you. Um, if I think of this not as a family of embedded two manifolds, but as, as a single embedded three manifold inside something four-dimensional, is that smooth? Uh, yeah, so that, that is, that in fact, is an excellent way to think about it. I mean, okay, is so it or is and, it not? And so this will be, yeah, you'll see, you can view this as level, so you can think of, exactly, we'll do this in, in, a, in a sense in, in, a, in a moment, and then I'll explain what happens there. Okay, so that is exactly the way to think about it. You think of this as some object in a higher dimensional space, and these are slices, these are level sets. Yes, and my question. And so you can imagine, yes, and so you can imagine that you have a, these might be level sets of a smooth function, for instance. This, that turns out, these, we will view it this way. It turns out it's a little bit complicated, so that function will not be smooth. But I'll, I'll come back on that in, in a little bit. Okay, so um, this, this case of the symmetry of revolution was analyzed in complete generality in the mid-90s uh, by Altschuler, Agnew, and Iga, and, and independently Sonner and, and Suganides. And so, right, so now, this example of the dump, so it, when we had finite time extinction, it was clear what to do. Uh, sorry, when we had um, this finite time extinction and there was just one singular time where everything became extinct. Then you have some idea what to do because you have classical hypersurfaces and they can flow by the mean curvature as long as it's defined. <coughs> In the case of the dumbbell, you need to face um, that you need a notion of a weak solution because the flow has continued past the first singularity. So the notion, there are several notions of a weak solution. The one we'll talk about here is, is the level set flow. So um, this was implemented in America by Osher and Sethian in 1989. The idea is that we think of, um, so that our initial surface, you choose a function where this is a level set. Of course, there are many such functions. Now, you take all of those, the level sets of that function, and you simultaneously flow them all by mean curvature. Okay, so this, at first, sounds like a horrible idea, because we were trying to do the, uh, we we're trying to flow, our problem was to flow one hypersurface. And that was hard. So now we've replaced it by 
take an entire family of hyperservices and try to float them all at the same time. Uh, so miraculously, this can be implemented. Um, but the first question I wonder is, uh, so why, why would it make sense? Well, if I run this flow and I say that all the, hyper, uh, the level sets flow simultaneously, why will they remain level sets? If you take two level sets, two different level sets of a function, of course they don't touch. So here, implicitly we're using, in order to make sense of this, that if you take two disjoint hyperservices and you flow them both, then in the future they won't touch. That's exactly the avoidance principle. So that's why there's a, a chance that this may succeed. So this was um, implemented theoretically by Adam Struck and Chen Yu Goto in 1991. They proved that the equation you get, which is a, a nonlinear degenerate parabolic equation, um, admits continuous viscosity solutions. These solutions are, are unique. And um, so this is a notion of weak solution. You would like it if the flow, if a smooth flow exists, you'd like it to match up and make sure that's exactly the case. So if you have a classical flow, then these weak solutions do agree with the classical flow for as long as they're defined. So this is um, you know, the theory of viscosity solution. OK, so the surfaces that I've shown you so far, they all have a property called mean convexity. So this uh, mean convexity means the mean curvature has a sign. So along the, the surface, the flow is initially just moving inward. Okay, so these are, for the rest of the talk, this will be all, the, what I'll talk about, these, uh, these monotone flows. So if you look, um, right, so in this setting, so what's known is if it's initially mean convex, then, so Evans, Brock, Chen, Kim, Yugoto, they proved existence for this level set flow equation in the mean convex case. They showed the solution with Lipschitz. And, and Brian White showed that as it, it moves in, it essentially foliates things inside with a singular foliation. So what's happening is you take this initial mean convex domain, the flow starts moving in, it remains mean convex. There may be some, so, so these level sets may have some, some critical points where uh, topology changes, things split apart, or things come potentially, you would imagine, together, although that does not happen. Uh, and so as it does, it's monotonically sweeping out this domain bounded by the initial hypersurface. So I'll return later in the talk, and I'll say there's a lot more known about what happens here, but I don't, uh, I need to some more uh, terminology before I do that. So we're going to define the arrival time. So, okay, so you have this domain, it's being convex. That's uh, on the boundary, uh, the time is zero, that's when we start setting. As, we, as you move inward, it sweeps through the entire domain. Pick a point there. There's some time where the level set moves through there. So that time, we'll call the arrival time. It's the time the front arrives at that point. So this is this function u. <coughs> this arrival time function uh, can also, uh, also arises as a solution to a deterministic game. There's an interesting interpretation of that. OK, so let's see two examples of the arrival time. So the first is for the spheres. So th as the spheres contract, um, so here I've made the initial time negative uh, with this square root of minus 4t. You can just, so that says the radius is square root of minus 4t, or the radius squared is minus 4t. So t is the arrival time, so we get the, the function of this quadratic polynomial. Uh, for cylinders, about the axis, you can also get a, a quadratic polynomial. So here, a couple of things to notice from these arrival time is that the critical points of the, of the arrival time are the singularities of the flow. Um, and the second thing is that the second order Taylor series is describing the singularity. So the reason, so, so here for the sphere, the radius, so the center is zero, that's where you have the singularity. And so that's the critical point of this function. For the case of the cylinder, the critical point is along the entire axis. And so that's where the, the singularities occur for the flow. And so for the cylinders about the x3 axis, you'll notice the x3 is missing from the arrival time. That's the variance in the x3 direction. So not only, so this arrival time, it's second order Taylor polynomial. It tells you what flow looks like near these points. And by seeing, it in the case of cylinders, the missing variable tells you the direction of the axis of the cylinder. Okay, so there's a couple of features to keep in mind. Okay, so now, uh, P, uh, let me write down a PDE. So the arrival time solves a second order degenerate 
elliptic uh, nonlinear PDE, which is, is written down here. So if you'll notice, so this, uh, a couple features of this PDE. The first thing is <coughs> it's not particularly well behaved at point at critical points where the gradient vanishes. So you're dividing by the norm of the gradient. Uh, the second thing, even if you're not concerned about that, if you look at the expression on the right, this is not uh, truly elliptic. So what's happening here, remember the Laplacian, I trace over the whole diagonal matrix. But now I'm going to trace the Hessian over the, the, the identity matrix. Uh, but I'm subtracting out the, the Hessian in the normal direction. So the gradient is, is perpendicular to the level set. So we're taking out that normal Hessian. So you're really only tracing over uh, two directions. So it's not truly an elliptic equation. But these, this sort of equation is called degenerate elliptic. So as I mentioned, um, so using viscosity solutions, uh, it, you can, it was shown that there exists a solution to this, um, and, and this solution is, is Lipschitz. So I'm, our first interest is going to be, how smooth is this solution? So we have a, a solution to a, a, a PDE. We'd like to ask you know, how smooth is it? The existence theory gives it its Lipschitz. In 1992, Tom Elmanen um, gave, ex you know, gave examples which showed that it, uh, it doesn't have to be C2. It may not be continuously twice differential. So in fact, the dumbbell is such an example so that, where that, that level set is not, uh, where, where this function is not C2. OK, so, um, so the optimal regularity here. So we know that, that it's always at least Lipschitz. And we know it need not be C2. So uh, Toby and I showed that, in fact, it's always twice differential. So the second derivatives exist at every point. Um, and at critical points, so, if you, so the critical points for the, the arrival time function, these are the same as singularities for the flow. The second order Taylor polynomial, since the critical point, there's no first order term. The second order Taylor polynomial is exactly comes from either the, the, the one from the sphere or the cylinder. So that's, that's what it, the uh, second order Taylor polynomial is at those, those critical points. And so in fact, um, this thing that was solved weakly, it's actually a classical function that's twice differentiable. And as I said, uh, even though the second derivatives it, do exist, they may not be continuous. So this is twice differentiable, but not necessarily C2. It's, it's certainly our case where it is C2, so let's go back to uh, the context case. So in 1990, uh, Riskin showed that it, it always is C, it is C2 in the convex case. In 2008, uh, Natasha Sesson gave examples of the, the convex initial uh, hypersurfaces where, while it is C2, it's not three times differentiable. In the curve shortening flow, so if you're in the plane, then Bob Cohn and Sylvia Serpati in 2006 proved that, in fact, it's always C3. So Natasha's examples are interesting. So uh, in order to figure out how differentiable it is, you look at the linearized problem. So you, you, if at a sphere, of course, it's infinitely diff differentiable. The round sphere is just, it really is just a uh, second order polynomial. These things are all, as you get near the singularity, they're all perturbations of the sphere. It's sphere plus higher order terms that are, are going to go away. So what matters, of course, is whether these uh, higher order terms, will these mess up the differentiability to once you get past the second derivative. So the, the condition for whether or not um, derivatives exist past the second depends on whether certain uh, terms are, are present in the linearization. So you can, I that's about that. Excuse me. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, what happens if the surface is algebraic or real analytic? Ah, ah. Uh, good question. Yeah, algebra. yeah, they, uh, yeah, they are. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Certainly, if it's in it, yeah, right. Initially, so the flow smoothing. So whatever you stick in for short time will become real analytic. So even in the case where we had um, non-differentiability, uh, so with, uh, sorry, even in the cases where the second derivative is not continuous. It will come from an algebraic or a real analytic, not algebraic, it will come from a real analytic initial data. OK, so, um, right, so, so now we, we know that it, so this is op, you know, optimal regularity. These solutions are always twice differentiable. So that means you know, it's, the first derivatives exist in a continuous, and 
The second derivative, which are given as limits of different quotients, those always exist. They may not be continuous. When are they continuous? Okay, so that's, that's the question I'd like to address next. So uh, there's a surprisingly um, simple geometric condition for when you, you get this continuity of the second derivatives. So you, continuity, if and only if, there's only one critical value. So in other words, the only singular time is the extinction time. And in fact, the critical set at that time uh, fits into one of the two examples we've seen. So either it's just a single point, so like the collapse, like a, a convex thing of the collapsing sphere, or it's a simple closed C1 curve. And, and in the second case, it looks cylindrical near the curve. So if you um, look at a point along this curve and look a little bit backwards in time, what you see is a cylinder, something very close to a cylinder that's shrinking off and will hit this curve. Okay, so, and in fact, this, um, this curve is tangent to the, the Hessian. Remember that when I wrote down the Taylor polynomial for the cylinder, they, um, the second, they didn't, the Hessian had a curve, so the next three squared term was missing. So that direction exactly is the direction of the curve. So in particular, the sphere cylinder and, and this maritrine, it is going to be C2 in those cases, whereas for the dumbbell, it's not. Because there, there's a single, um, right, so there are two times, so that violates even number one. And in fact, already at the first time, we violated because you get a point where it looks cylindrical just before the singularity, um, but it's not a simple close C1 curve. Okay, so, right, so this, these, this, these can be viewed, especially the first one, as a purely analytic result. So you write down a second order degenerate elliptic PDE, solutions exist, what's the optimal regularity? Okay, so in order to understand the solution of this, we need geometry. So now I'm gonna, I'd like to explain a little bit about that. Okay, so there's a, a, a theory for what solution, so what singularities look like for these flows. And it starts uh, in 1990 with, with Gerhard uh, and the monotonicity formula. This monotonicity formula allows one to get control over rescalings of the flow, so similar to a, a, a blow-up analysis for, for minimal subanticles. Um, minimal variety, so. Uh, and so using this monotonicity, uh, Tom Millen and Brian White uh, proved the existence of a, a self-similar structure just before a singularity. So um, we've already seen this in the examples we've seen where if we look just before the singularity, we either see spheres that are collapsing down and becoming round, or we see cylinders that are collapsing down in a, a self-similar way. These, these solutions, if I look at one of these solutions and dilate it, I see exactly the same thing. Okay, so this, and this turned out you know, not to be an accident. Um, it, it always has to happen that you, that you see these, these sort of picture. Okay, so in general, without mean convexity, there's a, a huge zoo of possible singularities or possible self-similar structures that you could see right before the singularity. But um, so the work of, of, of Gerhard and, and Brian White, um, we know what mean convex singularities look like. So in dimension, so in R3 like this, it always looks like a sphere or a cylinder just before the singularity. So this, uh, there's, there's a lot of work that one can go on a finer level like this as well. And so. Uh, so Gerhard and, and, and uh, Sinistrari and Andrews, uh, Hasselhofer and Kleiner uh, have all done this. And in fact, this sort of description, the more estimates that we need for this, this sort of thing, now you can imagine, uh, so there's a parallel thing, parallel development for dealing with singularity. So instead of looking at weak solutions that go through the flow, one might try to do something more along the lines of, of the hamilton Perlman work with Ritchie flow and try to do a surgery. So you, you go near a singularity, you know, hit the pause button, make some changes, and then restart. And so that was implemented first uh, for two convex flows by uh, Gerhard and Carlos Sinistrara. And it's recently been done for mean complex flows in, in R3 by, by Grendel and Kruskin as well as Hasselhoff and Kleiner. OK, so, so this is a uh, picture with the I'll omit this for right now. I'll just to say that these, um, these singularities that we see in the mean convex case they play a, a major role in the theory. They're, they're not relevant just in the convex case. They, they seem to be the most important singularities. 
Okay, so right, so here's this, so here's this idea. We have a singularity of a flow, and now we want to look at it in a neighbor to the singularity just before the singular time. And now we see a common picture. So either we see something like a sphere that's shrinking and will disappear at that point, or we see something like a cylinder that's also shrinking. That, that's the picture just before the singularity. So now from the we already know what the arrival time looks like for these two singularities. So they're these second order polynomials. Um, and so we can, so from this picture, we now know to second order, what does the arrival time look like near the singularity? It's either the Taylor series of, of the spheres, which is this, you know, uh, you know, mod x squared this diagonal one, or it's the one for the cylinder, where I have a two by two diagonal block, and then I have the missing a zero in the other direction, which is along the axis of the cylinder. So if you want to have continuity, uh, sorry, if you want to have existence of the second derivative, then we're going to need that as you're zooming in, you see the same picture. Okay, so, so there's this question of uh, uniqueness, right? So we're guaranteed that if we look just before a singularity, we see something like a, a shrinking sphere. That's, the sphere looks, you know, all spheres look the same. Or we see a cylinder. Not all cylinders look the same. So I could have one with one axis, or I could have one rotated with a different axis. Right? So if this, um, as I'm zooming in, if this axis is changing, you know, so I, I look at it under one magnification, I see one cylinder. I up the magnification, and now I see a, a different cylinder. So if that happens, I'm not going to get existence of second derivatives at this, at this point. Okay, the, the tail of second order Taylor series is not going to be well defined. It's jumping around from one scale to the next. So this sort of um, question about whether you have uniqueness as you, uh, of the picture as you zoom in on something, is a, a uniqueness of flow. It's been studied in many contexts in, uh, in geometric analysis. So, um, so there's a, a corresponding problem which might give you a, a might illustrate this well. So when I taught uh, as a graduate student at Stanford, we uh, we taught calculus with these TI81. The number must be higher now. Uh, with graphing calculators, and the way that we were supposed to teach the idea of a tangent line or a derivative is you would, you would grab a function, and then you would start zooming in. As you zoomed in under higher and higher magnification, the graph of this function would converge to a straight line. That straight line was the tangent line. Its slope was the derivative at the point. Okay, so if you were to zoom in on something that wasn't differentiable, it's still possible that it could look like a line as you zoom close to a line as you zoom in, but the line may jump around. So you've seen these sorts of things, these sort of fractal objects, like the, the cock curve. Okay, so, um, so, this, so differentiability is equivalent to saying as you zoom in on a function, it's well approximated by the same uh, linear function. Okay, or the graph is approximated by the same line. We're looking at a similar question here. So just um, so, so this uniqueness of blowups means that you have the singularity. There's some first order uh, object, you know, first order approximation to the singularity, that's this self similar object, this blow up. And as you zoom in on different scales, you want to make sure you always see the same one. So, so when, do you, when do you get this? That's the unique. <laughs> okay, so, um, right, and, and, and so in paper in 20, 2015, Toby and I showed that in this, if you have a cylindrical blow up, so, so that, again, the setting we're in, you always get uniqueness. So, in other words, if, if you Zoom in, so just before a singularity of mean curvature flows, if it looks like, so something like the dumbbell with the neck pinch, if I zoom in on that at times just before the singularity, I always see the same cylinder. Okay, so it's not rotated in space. It's always exactly the same one. So, um, right, so the, there was a, the, the key ingredient for showing this is a, a way of shape its inequality. So there was, <coughs> so this is a, something inspired by real algebraic geometry. So the, um, I, I hope maybe at the end to come back and say a little bit more about this. But this um, zooming in process is very similar to, to having a gradient flow, to running a gradient flow. And, and so you can ask the question, if you look at a gradient flow, and you know that there's some, some points that you keep returning to infinitely often, when do you know that in fact the gradient flow converges? 
So when is the gradient flow line going to have a limit point? This is a theorem of, of way of shape. It's uh, proved that this was always the case if the function is real analytic. And the key was that an inequality, or two inequalities for uh, real analytic functions on Euclidean space that are known as the way of Shabbos inequalities. So in this setting, the gradient flow is happening on an infinite dimensional space, and we need some way of Shabbos inequality in that, in that setting. Uh, and it's just time at the end. I'll say a little bit about that. OK, so we have this uniqueness. And so that means that at the level of a second order uh, Taylor series, we're always seeing the same one as we zoom in on the critical point. It, it's not hard to imagine. That, that this is the key for showing that the second derivatives exist at that point. That's the key idea. Or that's, once you establish this, it, it's not hard to get the, uh, the existence of the second derivative there. Okay, so this, there are a number of other applications of this, so I, uh, this uniqueness. So I'd like to go on and talk a little bit about that. So now this is uh, going to be more geometric in nature. Okay, so um, we've touched on this at all, but there's this idea of a single so far, there's this idea of a singular set. So for these flows, um, if you start with a smooth hypersurface, then for some short time, everything remains completely smooth. Uh, and it, it, in fact, it smooths things out. This is a heat equation, a heat equation. Uh, but eventually, the nonlinearities take over, and, and the singularities uh, develop. So if you look at the set of points where the flow in space and time where the flow is not smooth, we'll call this the singular set. In the examples that we've looked at so far, so for the sphere, there's only one point where it's singular in space time, that's the extinction point. Uh, in the cylinder, it becomes the singular set is the line, and this happens just at a single time. And in the Meridian, again, there's only one uh, singular time, and at that singular time, the set of singularities is a circle, and that's one. So in the case of a dumbbell, there are two singular times and three singular points. So the, the neck pinch point, and then the two extinctions later in time. So in the mean convex case in, in 2000, Brian White showed that uh, the singular set is always one-dimensional. So this, so what does it mean to be one-dimensional? <coughs> it means that if you look at that the Hausdorff measures for any dimension bigger than one, then you get zero measure. So, so there's a subset of space time. And this is actually stronger than it sounds because the relevant Hausdorff uh, measure is a parabolic one, which counts twice uh, times having two dimensions. Okay, uh, now this is a danger time. It's been a long time since there's been a question. I'm starting to go fast. Okay, so, uh, right. You're not going to be today, I hope. Okay, so this, uh, right, so now I'd like to uh, look at this singular set. Okay, so what can we say about this, this set of singularities in general? So we have these examples where the singularities are lines, points, curves. And we have a general theory which says that it's, uh, the set of singularities always has dimension at most one. OK, so, uh, so this uh, is called rectifiability here. So, so in a paper in 2016, uh, Toby and I showed that this singular set is always contained in a uh, finite union of C1 curves. Okay, so something like what you see with the marriage ring. You get this collection of curves. And so after you, you take what's in the C1 curve, whatever's left over is some countable collection of points. So what you imagine is the place where you get the curves corresponds to uh, cylindrical singularities. And the, when you get the points, those roughly should correspond to these spherical extinctions. Of course, that's not entirely true because of something like the dumbbell, where we have a, a neck pinch. That looks, um, you know, to zero, you know, to first order. This looks like a cylinder, but of course, there's just this one singular point, and so that's why you end up with uh, saying that it's contained in this finite union of compact curves instead of equal to it. Because somehow there may be these places that where it was supposed to be more singular than it is. So the key for showing this this rectifiability uh, is the uniqueness. So let me just remind you that a set is said to be rectifiable if it's well approximated by a linear space at every scale. OK, so uh, I'd like to connect this, explain how the, uh, the uniqueness fits together with this structure of the singular set. So let's imagine that you have a singular point. So if there's some singular point at, you know, at, a, at a point x at time 0, then if I look at slightly negative time, 
So I look just before this, then I'm going to see a cylinder here. Let's not worry about the sphere case. So if I look just before here, this, then I act, the entire flow in this neighborhood is very well approximated by a cylinder. Okay, and in fact, we show that you can do this on some uniform scale. Okay, so now suppose you have another singular point. Just for simplicity, let's imagine it's at the same time. Nearby, but at the same time. I now go backwards in time. The flow near this one is also approximated by a cylinder. Well, backwards in time, the two regions overlap. So you have these two cylinders. They must be extremely close together. So one thing that is telling you is the axis of the cylinder has to essentially connect the two singular points. Okay, so any other, so any other singular point at this time, it has to be contained in a small neighborhood of this axis. This is rectifiability. It's saying that the set is well approximated by a linear space. The linear space is just the axis of the cylinder. Okay, so this is, this is the key. This explains why it's true. A couple of, you know, and so that's at the same time. You can actually see this to see why they must be at the same time. Because if, they, if they're nearby, if, they were at, um, if they're too close together and they're at different times, well, the cylinders would be on different scales. If you, but there'd be a common backwards time where they're both approximated by cylinders. One would be much smaller than the other, but the regions would overlap, and that would be a problem. So this is saying that these nearby singularities must happen at nearly the same time as well. So all that's encoded in this, this uniqueness. Right, so this is the role of uniqueness in, 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 in proving this structure of the singular set. Is it, um, is it known that the singular set can be, for example, a closed interval? There are no examples of that. Um, yeah, so the, the singular set, right, so the examples that we have, you know, the, this curve and, and the points, um, yeah, it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a mystery, um, and and in fact, there's some other interesting things that, that happen here. Uh, that so the examples we've shown for the uh, singular times, uh, it's just been at isolated points. So this this uh, really in a way this is this would allow there to be singularities at some Cantor set potentially in time, uh, but nothing like that is known. And in fact, Brian has conjectured that's not. Okay, so let me just say a very brief word. Uh, so I, I restricted everything to uh, mean curvature flow in R3. And in higher dimensions, you get a similar result. So now, um, the role of, of cylinders, there are now many options. There are many more options. You can take a sphere of any dimension, cross it with a plane of complementary dimension. And so all of those are, are singularities in the mean convex case. And so the, the corresponding, and again, we get uniqueness there. Um, and the corresponding statement for the, uh, for the regularity uh, of the singular set is the singular set is now contained in this finite union of, of compact C1 n minus 1 manifolds, um, and then plus a set of lower dimension. In fact, you can say much more than just a set of lower dimension. So this is a the sort of thing that's a stratification result of a sing singular, singular set. Um, in fact, we get this, uh, we can keep going with the rectifiability. So the, once you look at the stuff that's of the top dimension, the stuff that's left over isn't just of dimension, uh, of lower dimension, but in fact, it too is stratified. And so it's rectifiable. So it's contained in a, a union of uh, C1 manifolds. Once we get below the, the top dimension, then we can't say it's a finite union anymore. We have to say a countable union. That, so where that comes from is at the top dimension, we can actually prove some sort of uniform approximation. And so this gives, this gives some sort of compactness. Whereas below, um, you can't do it uniformly, and so there, there may be count for many. Okay, so, this, um, okay. so now I wanted to just say a little bit about these uh, way of shape inequalities. <coughs> so so the, the main tool for the uniqueness theorem, there, there are two infinite dimensional uh, way of shape inequalities. So let me just remind you what those are. So if you have an, an analytic function on, on Euclidean space, um, then there's you can actually bound. Over, okay, so 
you can bound this distance to the, uh, the zero set uh, in terms of the value of the function. So the, this is the first way of sharing this inequality. And uh, way of sharing this, <coughs> use this to, to prove a uh, conjecture and analysis of uh, Laurent Schwartz, the division conjecture. Um, uh, around the same time, Hormander proved a special case of this conjecture uh, for polynomials. He proved the same inequality for polynomials. So the, um, a little bit later, uh, a few years afterwards, Wojciechowicz realized that, that this first inequality implied a second Wojciechowicz inequality called the gradient inequality. So this one says that if you have an analytic function and you look near a critical set, then the, the function is bounded in terms of the variation of the function is bounded in terms of the gradient. So what, in some neighborhood, one immediate consequence of this inequality is that if you were to have another critical point nearby, well, the gradient is zero. So the function must have exactly the same value. Okay, so for an analytic function, uh, at each critical point, there's a neighborhood where um, every other critical point takes the same value. This isn't true for C infinity functions. You can imagine taking something like a, uh, right, like a, a sine curve and, and making it oscillate even more rapidly, but kill it off to make it uh, still differential, <coughs> smooth at, at the origin, and then you would get accumulated crystal points of different crystal points. Okay, so here, um, right, so there, this was there's an application to that one as well. Okay, so now, um, right, so, so what did, uh, so what's the relevance of the way of, of shape inequalities to this talk? So is this, uh, this result on gradient flows. So if you have an analytic function, and you now look at the, a gradient flow for this, and suppose that this, this you have a flow line, where there's a limit point. So this is a point where it returns to, it returns near infinitely often, arbitrarily close and infinitely often. Uh, so in general, for a smooth function, you can have something like this, where you might have a flow line that, say, circles an entire curve of critical points. But for an analytic function, you cannot. So the, the flow line must have finite length, and in fact, the, must be converging to this critical point. Okay, so how does this uh, connect here? So many of the, the geometric PDEs that we look at uh, can be thought of as, as the gradient flows, but now um, it's gradient flows for a function on some infinite dimensional space. So one obvious example would be if you look at mean curvature flow. Mean curvature flow is a gradient flow for the area function. It's the steepest descent for area. So as you run the flow, um, if you'd like to know, suppose you'd like to know you go to a unique limit, well then exactly you would think about something like a way of shape of inequality in order to try and prove something like that. But now it would be on this infinite dimensional space. Okay, so um, okay, so what's the way of shape of inequality? in this setting. So here, there's a functional, it's this Gaussian area, area functional that uh, Gerhard introduced in his monotonicity formula. And this blowing up process can be thought of as a gradient flow for this Gaussian area function. So as this, uh, as, and so now we, we would like to have a uh, way of Shevitz inequality for the Gaussian area. And so that's exactly what we show. We show that the so I have this unintelligible equation here where nothing's defined. So basically what this says is that if you look at the distance from a, a sigma sum surface, C is the set of critical points. So these are fixed points for the flow. These are the singularities that we're going to. These are the cylinders. And so your distance to a cylinder is bounded in terms of the gradient of this Gaussian area. So the, um, the fixed, now remember we're, the, we're talking about a flow for, for Gaussian area. And so uh, this, um, right, so so we're, we want to show that this gradient flow for Gaussian area converges to a, a fixed cylinder, and so this is exactly the sort of inequality that you, that you would want. <coughs> okay, so uh, right. Okay, so I think I think I should probably stop there. Thank you.